So, hello and welcome to this year's Berlin Dance Music event. I am very thankful that you're all here. And um, today we have a special guest, the one and only Joko. What's up? So, today I have the honor to interview him a little bit, ask him some questions about his life and how he became the person he is. So, Hannes, tell us a little bit. How, how did you start with music? How did you first get into music and what were your first influences when you started? Uh, yeah, it was... I wouldn't even say it was an accident or something, but it uh, was pure boredom at uh, university where I was studying. I was uh, living in Cologne, but studying in the south of Germany. And uh, how it is usually when you move to a new city, you just know nobody. So uh, yeah, I was sitting in my student home and uh, didn't know what to do with my time. And just uh, yeah, thought, uh, why not download Ableton and do some very shitty mashups or something? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and it all kind of evolved from there. So the mashups became a bit better, I hope. <laughs> 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 and it evolved into a little bit into like doing like full music tracks, which you could play. Yeah. Full tracks. So what were your first influences when you really started? Did you have like special heroes you looked up to or any influences like from earlier music styles? Uh, I always say the, the same two names. I, I mean, there were several, definitely along the way, but uh, the ones which I would really say made the biggest impact on my like musical taste or liking would be like Josh Butler, uh, Sidney Charles. Um, yeah, these, these two really, yeah. And then everyone who was kind of, uh, you know, in the same kind of bubble of them, you know, uh, yeah. like Dale Howard was a big one definitely in the beginning. Uh, yeah, these. Nice, nice. <laughs> So um, when you first started making music, how did you how did you make it like a professional way? Like how uh, when did you first release your first track and how did that get along? Uh, I can't even remember what year it was. I think, um, yeah. I mean, in the beginning, when you're just doing the tracks for yourself a little bit and uh, not really having the goal even to release it or play it out somewhere. I was happy uh, that um, after I just uploaded some sketches on SoundCloud um, back in the day that there were some labels actually approaching me, like sending me messages uh, if I want to release it. And uh, yeah, for me at that time, it was like a dream to be able to go on Beatport and just buy the track, you know. So yep. uh, I didn't really have like a selection, you know, like you couldn't have a selection there since it was like only one or two labels asking you to yeah. do so. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that was like the first first time uh, when I was releasing music. So um, must have been like 2014, third, yeah, 14, I think. So three years after I opened Ableton. Nice. I think. And what, what were the first labels that contacted you? And how did they actually influence your musical career from then on? Um, the first one <laughs> was a label which doesn't really exist anymore. It's, it's uh, called Mad Mole Music from Serbia. I only just recently had a gig there and then I only just made the connection again that the label was from there and there was actually a guy who was connected to the crew from the label, you know? So it was funny um, to, to uh, have the little reminiscing about the label again. And uh, the first... Yeah, not bigger, but the more serious label I would say was the Chief Recordings, which I, uh, which is from Amsterdam, which is also not really active anymore. But um, uh, I got to know the guy really well. I helped him do like artworks and stuff. So after some time, I kind of grew into the label myself instead of just releasing there. Uh, since I was a graphic designer, and this is, was the reason I s I came there to study in the first place. I thought, like, why not help him a little bit with doing the graphics for it, you know? And um, yeah, did it for like three or four years, and um, after that, uh, I kind of lost interest a little bit in the graphic design. No, oh, <laughs> <the label. laughs> no, this is I, I still love doing the graphic design, all the graphic as graphical aspects about releases and everything about the promotion or something, you know. So. Um, but uh, that was kind of the thing I could give back to him for kind of, you know, messaging me, you yeah. know, and being happy about that. So, uh, yeah. Okay, nice. 
And if you tell us a little bit about yourself, like um, how does your daily studio life look like? Like, if do you just find inspiration? Where do you find your inspiration? And how do you how do you start a track, for example? Um, the formula is kind of always the same. Um, I get inspired by just uh, listening to other tracks, which I really really like or learn to like, love almost and uh, just trying to kind of get the same feeling going on in my own tracks then you know to to find like a certain element in the track which i really like which makes me go like ah, i want to create a track right now which has the same like hi-hat rhythm or something it can be something super stupid you know but uh, anything that makes me want to start and open ableton you know is uh, inspiration enough so um, it's mostly other tracks uh, sometimes it's just playing around with a new instrument that I bought or something, you know, also out of boredom. You don't you don't really need all this shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, if um, if you set yourself like the limit, like uh, ah, this is a new thing I, I got, it must have some cool sounds and you're just browsing there, then it all starts. You start doing a track uh, like uh, without noticing, I would say. Okay, nice. And if you start your tracks, like, what is your favorite plugin or your go-to like synthesizer that you use mostly? Uh, the one which I used most is definitely the uh, Nordlead. It's like a red kind of uh, hardware uh, stands out from all the other synthesizers. <laughs> synthesizers. <laughs> synthesizers. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, yeah, I don't think there's any any other in uh, synthesizer which is red, right? <laughs> so they must have. This one going for them. Um, yeah, this is the one I use the most um, because it has like some super nice pads and synths in there. I didn't really use it for bass yet or something. Um, maybe I have, but can't remember. Um, apart from that, uh, I just got into, or just got is a little bit uh, not enough. Um, like since half a year or something, I'm still uh, getting into like a older kind of a rhythm machine, which is called the MC505. Um, yeah, Tal <laughs> Talo, who is sitting in the crowd, has uh, the bigger version of it, which I also wanted to get maybe. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, after half a year, I think I used like every s possible sound which it has already in there. So, um, need to get the upgraded version then. <laughs> yeah. So, to someone who hasn't heard your tracks before or doesn't really know who you are, how would you describe your own sound? Uh, it's hard. <laughs> uh, joyful, definitely. Uh -huh. um, playful, I hope. Um, not too serious uh, and groovy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Very nice, very nice. And um, you also do collaborations often, or not? Like working together with people on tracks. How mm -hmm. does that get along? And how do you select the people that you work with in that time? Um, <coughs> doesn't even have to come from me liking their productions so much, but uh, me liking their tastes of uh, tracks, what what they like. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, most of the time, obviously, you want to collaborate with someone who you look up to, like production-wise. Um, but I get more of a joy, I would say, of. Uh, getting to work with someone who's maybe not as technical, um, how do you say, um, versiert, versatile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, who's not too much into the technical aspect of doing a track, but knows what he wants to have in tracks. So um, I can maybe be the executive hand then on the technical side of things, but he brings in stuff which I would never think about in the first place, you know, so this is often the best kind of collaboration instead of just uh, searching for someone who does the same sound that you do yeah. and um, yeah there's probably not that much new stuff coming out of it instead of uh, searching for someone who you who always shows you new things you know yeah so. and who did you like to work with most is there a special uh -uh. person or do you just like a general or is there someone that really inspires you when you work together with them? No, I don't have a special one. I mean, I always love to uh, do music with Talo when he has uh, some spare time. <laughs> uh, Chris Dossi obviously was a, was a super nice uh, uh, collaboration partner. Uh, hence why we already had like four EPs done together. So I'm always using the uh, possibility when I'm in Amsterdam to uh, 
catch up with him, uh, book in a few days before or after, which I'm now only just able to since I quit my job. But before that, it was even more a hassle to yeah. find like days where you can come together in the studio. And the first collaboration that we made uh, was all just through the internet. So. And how did this all come together? Like, how did you get to meet Chris Dussy and be part of the PIV crew as well? Uh, he um, just messaged me, I think, af on SoundCloud after uh, he played like a gig together with Jesse Maas. Um, he's also part of the PIV crew. Um, and he was playing, Jesse Maas was playing like a, a track from me at their back to back session. And he was, uh, and Stossi was like, oh, who's that? Who's that? <laughs> Which is nice, <laughs> of course. Uh, but uh, he knew my sound from a little bit back in the days, which uh now has obviously changed a little bit so he was keen on you know since after he played like a lot of my tracks then afterwards which have helped me really really much um he wanted to get in the studio together and then we had a piff night in cologne where i'm from and um yeah he was actually the one asking me if we want to get our heads together a few days before the event and you know just uh, work on something so And did you manage to actually make a track before the gig itself? Yeah, we made uh, four tracks. <laughs> four tracks, wow. Yeah, no, he, uh, he came like two days uh, prior to the event. Uh, sporty, uh, sporty. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for um, we've never met before, you know, so it's always like a little risky situation to just uh, drive somewhere, meet someone you've never met before, and maybe it's not clicking, but you're dedicating yourself already for two days, you yeah. know? So it would be very awkward if we wouldn't get along, <laughs> you know? So like, ah, I think I left the oven on or something, I have to go. <laughs> I don't know. So you did feel the pressure behind it or what? Uh, of yeah, uh, pressure, I don't know. I mean, obviously there's always pressure when you meet someone who you also look up to production-wise and you really want to get something sick out of the studio, but uh, these are the times when there's nothing sick coming out of it mostly. Yeah. It's more if you just meet up to talk about new gear or something or anything else unrelated to making a track now. Yeah. You know, it's not like a chore, you know, it's more like, oh, what what have you been using? And like, uh, like discovering what the other side uses to do the track and then just opening up the plugin, maybe showing it to each other. And then it just suddenly starts there, you know, so. Um, the mo at the moment where you kind of meet up together to say like we need to make f a banger now it's never gonna yeah I can relate work. to that <laughs> 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 that's always really hard and um, so um, if you invite them over to the people um, how do you select the, the artists that you want to work with in that kind of way do you just like um, meet them or do you just like find them and you said like um, you were just like listening to the, the, the tracks they make as well that or they play mostly as well yeah as i said before like um the the taste they have in their own like sets or music selection or doesn't even have to be electronic music that they show me or something you know so uh, mostly obviously from the text that they send me which i also learned to like really much or it can even be totally unrelated to um to their dj sets or something like if i go somewhere to play and I just uh, really feel the energy with someone uh, and uh, we become friends apart from, you know, sending each other tracks all the time. You know, this can also be a cool factor to just uh, do something together, you know, so. Um, but there's not this one factor where I say, okay, this is the guy I want to work with. This is not the guy I want to work with. Obviously, he has to be dope guy <laughs> in the first place. Yeah, but. Okay, so nice. And um, when you produce, would you say you're more intuitive or more structured with your productions? How do you go along with that? Uh, I think more intuitive, like very spontaneous, like I don't have anything in mind, like except for what I said before, before like maybe copying like a hi-hat rhythm or whatever. Um, but um, I think it's more like subconscious things which are happening, which makes the structure, you know, like I've been building my tracks now uh, like with the 500 track that I've made in Ableton obviously there's a little structure but as soon as I know I'm following a structure too much I'm I want to do the opposite thing you know yeah. so um, 
yeah, I'm trying to avoid it by that, you know. So, so if you start a track, do you always start from from scratch, like from zero, yes. or do you? I I have some like send reverbs or something, yeah, which I'm trying to change every now and then, you know, like every three or four months, maybe I want to keep changing them. But um, apart from that, I would say it's a blank blank piece to start from, yeah. Okay, nice. And before you mentioned that you, you left your like regular job to be now a full-time magician, uh, musician, mm -hmm. how did that come apart? Like how, 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 how hard was it for you to make that decision and to really go full forward work with your like musical career? It was uh, hard because um, I was satisfied with the job. <laughs> yeah. um, at some point it was like not manageable, manageable anymore. Even though, like my my boss that I had, too, he was super cooperative, like uh, giving me the Monday off in like an urgent party situation or something, you know, or uh, uh, like working together with me on the schedule, like when can I come to work, when do I have a gig, you know. It's I think it's not like <laughs> always given like this, yeah. so I appreciate it already with 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 uh, the company I was uh, working at. Um, but yeah, now and I always had the fear, like if I quit my job. And uh, I'm sitting there during the week when I would usually be at the job. I would not be creative at all because uh, it was always like the compensation to the job where I did stuff yeah. for other people, you know. Um, I had to sit there. I, and then while I'm sitting there, I was already thinking like, okay, when I get back later, I'm going to do like a nice beat or something. And if I don't have like the thing, the, the face where I'm sitting there doing stuff for others, I was being afraid that I wouldn't have like the urge to to come home yeah. from the work and be in the studio but so far it's it's working great and um, I find other things which are then on my working schedule so so you did overcome that that part of it and you or is it really become like a job that you really feel okay now now that you have like a schedule maybe do you make yourself a schedule where you say okay this is my time where I have to sit in the studio and like be productive on that side or you just keep it open like when the inspiration comes yeah yeah keep definitely keep it open um i would never go and say like okay i'm waking up at eight i'm uh, then going to uh, have some breakfast go in the studio from nine to five or something and then uh yeah have the rest of the day off so there's never really a time during the day dedicated to making music you know it's yeah. since the spark from or the urge to create music comes from just you know maybe sitting there having no plans at all and just browsing through YouTube recommendations or something, you know? So, um, yeah, so no schedule for me. Okay, <laughs> and um, like I know you've been doing a lot of sample packs already for a long, long time. How did that start? Why did you even give out like so many sounds to the people? Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you know the unofficial ones, which yeah, I've been I doing. know the yeah. good ones. <laughs> so far, I've only made one official. Oh, one. okay, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> so I'm an insider, actually, then. <laughs> no, th those were the times where I felt like a little bit uninspired to, to do tracks, you know? So it's um, some people do their own sample banks, then during that time, like if you don't want to construct a whole track right now you or you don't have the time right now three hours to fully work on a track until the end um, then you kind of make yourself like smaller pieces which you can work off you know just finding a nice snare or uh, not even creating it or something you know just sampling it from records which you love or something making your own folder in Ableton or whatever DAW you're using and then uh, just have it there, you know, for yourself to dig through when you start a track and be quicker and come to the to the goal of finishing a track way, way quicker than you usually would. Okay, and now for your official um, sample pack that you were talking about, how did that go? Did you take samples from tracks you already released or and took parts of that? Or did you create something totally new for the people to have? Uh, no, there, those were all created by me <laughs> and uh, not stolen from other records <laughs> even though some of them are pretty standard you know like uh, <laughs> you can't like really invent a new 909 clap or something you know but I always try to give it at least my own twist a little bit um, yeah but uh, everything is uh, has not been used before I after I've done the pack I used the samples from the pack yourself yeah <laughs> okay so which is fair enough i guess you yeah, know sure. that's what they are for <laughs> you know <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah so my own sample pack is just uh, sitting next to all the other ones which i have so and if i type in clap or whatever or hi hat 
and it happens to be that it's my own, then I don't give a shit and yeah. then just put my own in. So <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. And um, saying that, like, how do you find the right samples for the productions that you use? Like you said, you sample sometimes from other tracks and stuff like that. How does that go along? Um, yeah, it does, doesn't really matter where it comes from uh, to me. Um, sometimes I feel like I want to make a hi-hat now for myself, which is never the case, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't really go too deep into like how to create a sound, you know? Like if I hear something somewhere else, uh, I know how to properly steal, you know? Yeah, like it, <laughs> uh, which is... <laughs> <laughs> and we all know that we steal from you as well, eh? Yeah. Oh, that makes me <laughs> that makes me happy to hear, man. Uh, so yeah, we steal all steal from each other, and uh, <laughs> that combination about, of yeah? steals is then the yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so production-wise, what are your next steps with that? Um, you also have like s several other aliases. Tell us a little bit more about that, maybe. Uh, yeah, just. Um, like until one year ago, I think when I started the Coulter one, which is my sure is it the sure name or surname? Surname. <laughs> my sure name. <laughs> Your sure name. For sure. <laughs> um but I was telling myself like uh, it doesn't matter what kind of music I'm doing, like I'm just gonna do it as Joko since it's me, you know. So uh but um since I've been quite uh, productive and doing a lot of tunes, I wanted to um kind of diversify the sound a little bit here and there and um, yeah told myself fuck what I said yesterday I'm just gonna uh, have a new one now for breakbeat stuff I'm gonna have a new one now for maybe um, deep even deeper kind of tracks which are maybe not even for the dance floor or something um, but yeah I just started with the Coulter one which is mainly breakbeat or everything apart from it um, but then also I have the collaboration projects, Dusko. Um, there's uh, one right now with uh, with Ray, um, and we call it Janeko. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I guess now it's gonna be my thing to always, you know, uh, play with the name of the guy I'm collaborating with and just put in a KO at the end. <laughs> KO. <laughs> DJ OKO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um, that's it. I think. Yeah. Maybe. Another alias will at some point spawn. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you, if you do these collaborations, how did it come apart that you really said, okay, we're making a new alias and this is not just like a collaboration, working together with a new artist? Um, that uh, one or two tracks which I made with Stussy were kind of a mistake. Okay, what do you or, mean with or mistake? Maybe, <laughs> maybe um, I, he has like a big management and stuff and they are always a little bit choosing as well for what he's going to do with the names as well. And I guess like the two tracks, for example, which we got out, um, the management was so keen on that he wanted to put his real name on it, you know, because um, originally the, the alias with Stasco was uh, created to... Um, to not have it connected to the main uh, DJ name, obviously, but because um, to keep the releases a little bit apart from each other, so that it's not stacked up like every week there's a new release, you know, and uh, have a little bit of uh, space in between to create a little bit more momentum and stuff. I'm not like this, to be honest. Uh, that's uh, more his decision. Um, I try to just uh, bang out whenever, whatever feels good to me, you know, and to not be too uh, anal about these kind of <laughs> things, you know, so, yeah. And on that side, do you yourself have a management or a booking agency that you work with specifically, or you do this all by your own? Uh, I have a manager, kind of, um, so yeah, someone who's been helping me a little bit with releases and all this stuff, but in the end only to also just give a fuck about his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, every now and then it's a good... Shout out to him probably, yeah? <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> Shout out to him. <laughs> <laughs> Peace. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to show it. <laughs> ah, so he's no, not no, no, but he knows, he, no, he knows <laughs> about it. Yeah, no, he makes he makes good good decisions at some point. Um, but yeah, uh, roots are there to be broken. broken you know, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's good to always have 
the, a good opinion in mind from somebody neutral and uh, who's not like sitting on the track and wants to get it out the next day, you know? So somebody who's holding you a little bit back from it, but yeah. So then how does everything go around with the promotion of your tracks and those things? Do you do that yourself? Because you also said you're like a graphic designer, so you design a lot of things. Do you always like keep up with that and like design some like graphics for you, the tracks that you make? Or do you also like, if you sign with another label, just leave it open to them doing the designs and all that? Well, the, if, if I'm releasing with another label, obviously they have their own design. Oh, it's not so CI. obviously. So I mean, I could guess you could sometimes push with them as well, no? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, the times are over, I think, where I do the graphics for other labels then. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I have my two labels, Hoof and uh, Joko Camp, <laughs> where I can just uh, bang out the stuff uh, whenever I want to. Obviously, with the Hoof one, uh, we are four guys. I think is it? Whoop, it's still on. <laughs> uh, we are four, four guys doing it, you know, so it's always a harder thing to push a track through everyone's liking until it's released, you know? So um, with the Joker camp, I can just do whatever I want and do the graphics I want, uh, even though they're not really masterpieces, you know? <laughs> yeah, I also stolen stuff, you know? So <laughs> all I, stolen, all I copyrighted. Hope this, this Disney <laughs> is not gonna, uh, yeah, come at me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, what was the question again? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> About the graphic design. Yes, I love uh, doing everything around it, obviously, but I also want to let the music do the talking kind of, you know, and not uh, be the super clown around it, you know. So um, a healthy kind of balance between that is, uh, I think, important. Uh, but yeah, if there's anything, I always try to have my graphical graphic designer eye on it a little bit. Nice, and nice. Prove it by him. <laughs> and how did the whole thing with the hoof crew start? Like, when did that come apart, and where's where's that all going to? Well, you know, because we already did a party together. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, when was that at again? I well, think 2016 or something, Yeah, right? probably. It's quite a long or time ago. Yeah. With uh, the one and only Miguel Bastida and Jacob B. <laughs> yes, man. It was a good one. It was a good one. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think like two, two years prior to that, um, Talo, um, who I mentioned before, um, came up with the idea of um, combining the house with groove <laughs> groove uh, hoof <laughs> house with groove yeah which is so stupid that it's good again Did you I actually think. have a tattoo of it on your arm or <laughs> not <laughs> my, o my only one man <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We that shows dedication yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> um uh, what was I saying again? Yes, uh, and um, it grew, I think at the beginning it was like a, a group of almost 11 people, mostly Talos fram friends from him, which he knows from back in the city where he comes from. Uh, and like slowly after the years, like uh, people went to study, people's uh, musical tastes has changed. Um, so now we are at the core, or we are reduced to the core. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, Pascal, who joined us later, is part of it, um, and also Julian, who's also originally from around Cologne, I think. Um, he's still with us, so we are now reduced to four, and um, yeah, still doing the parties. <laughs> so then if you're like four people, um, does everybody have their like uh, respective like part of the team? So everybody has their own like job to do in the team, or is it like... Like a mixture of it all. Um, <laughs> we only have one job in the team, which is given to color, and this is like <laughs> <laughs> being the fucking critic of everything and <laughs> not liking anything. <laughs> That's the main job, probably. I guess. <laughs> no, just, just kidding, man. It's a, it's a, it's yeah. Um, we work together. We all do the same. Uh, whenever something needs to be done, somebody's holding his hand up and. Uh, yeah, does it? <laughs> okay, I don't know. Yeah. It, like, there's not like an R, A and R or something. We all are the A and R or whatever. Um, uh, I'm mostly doing the job with like doing the pressings and stuff. You know, everything related to the vinyl, how it comes out. Um, I would say maybe Talo is the the one most versatile. This is the word I was searching for earlier. Versatile in like doing the PR. Uh, man management and um, you know all this around this since it's also his job to do it at the another label here in Berlin home again which is running 
So um, yeah, but apart from that, we are kind of just always sharing our thoughts in our WhatsApp group and try to work it out together. And do you find music yourself for the Hoof label or does it just come from you boys yourself or do you also accept demos and stuff like that? Um, we always say we accept demos, but then again, we're not really too eager to find stuff right now. It's, it's since the, the third, three releases that we had, which is not really that much for two years of uh, since the first release, um, they're all from us, you know. Um, <laughs> Some stupid alias as well from Gonzalo, <laughs> <laughs> as Dr. Octavio. In the end, it's always the same. We only just had one remixer who is Giamarco, um, who has been a uh, little sunshine DJ we had at our party a few years ago, who we somehow wanted to involve in the label, since we all, all four of us, really, really dig his style and the person he is, you know. So uh, that was kind of an exception so far to the. Uh, to the Hoof Crew releases, uh, but in general we're open for demos. Yeah, of course. Um, was just. Uh, but will you listen to them actually? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not like we're being overrun with demos, you yeah. know. Uh, so <laughs> whatever comes through comes through, you know. Um, we we listen to it, yeah. And how do you do it yourself at the moment? Do you send out demos to label, or is it just by now like you just release with yourself mostly, or they just come to you? Um, most of the time now. This is would be the job of uh, my manager now. Um, I'm just doing these, you know, and every now and then I would send him some stuff I've done. I'm not even sending him everything, but um, yeah, it, this is right now the. <laughs> Why do you keep stuff back from him? <laughs> yeah, because because uh, he is uh, doing a label called Berg Audio, and uh, it's more of a deeper label. And even though. He he knows like the most people around this kind of music, I would say. So if I'm doing something which I for sure know is gonna, if it goes somewhere, it's gonna be on my own label on Joko Camp. It, I don't send it to him since I'm also also doing like maybe a track a day some some weeks, you know. So well, that's uh, a lot. And <laughs> I don't want to bother his ears too much <laughs> then with it, you know. So uh, obviously, if you're doing so much music, there's also a lot of shit coming through. So uh, this is probably the reason why I don't want to pester him too much with about it, you know. Okay. That's where that's where we wanted to ask, like, how do you guarantee that the, the quality still stays the same? Or do you like do you have like a quality level where you say like hey maybe this 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 track is like too shitty to release right now or then you just keep it for yourself? Or is there like like if you like it, you like it? Or what how do you see that? I don't have quality control. <laughs> <laughs> At, uh, Yes, yeah, some sometimes the the tracks are kind of get lost in the SoundCloud private sector, <laughs> uh, and every every once in a while I would just you know maybe skip through maybe if there's some stuff which I still like, which is probably the ultimate test then, right? If it's supposed to be timeless, like every track in the world, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I still like it, maybe after having it done uh, after after half a year maybe or after a year whatever. Uh, and I still want to bring it out, then I'll make myself a note at Google Notes or something, you know, and then put the track there to maybe play it again or to maybe find a find a home for it or make some plans with it, you know. So, so how many tracks would you say are there in your SoundCloud that we have all never heard or never seen or will maybe not even see? Um, I well, there's a number when you're locked in, you can see the number of tracks that you've uploaded in general. And if you're not logged in and you look onto someone else's profile, it's just the ones which are public. Exactly. So the the ones which are in private is like 726, I think. Wow. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about the other numbers since I'm always logged into my account. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as I said before, also a lot of shit in there, which uh, shouldn't see the light of day, I guess. <laughs> And what would you say at the moment, uh, what were your biggest achievements so far as an artist and as a producer? Um, I don't really see that one pivot point or something. It's always like really gradually, you know, every every next release, you know, as soon as it comes out, out it's like, uh, yeah, you feel a little bit of pride, I guess. Uh, independent, independent of uh, how it's going to be conceived from the people, or how do you say conceived? Is it right? I don't know. 
regardless of how the people are gonna like it or not, you know, sometimes there were some tracks where I thought like, okay, this is my best work yet, and then this is the one which gets lost the most <laughs> in the EP or whatever. Then again, it, it's okay as soon as you, as long as you're satisfied yourself with it, and uh, uh, you maybe can hold a vinyl of yourself in the in your hands, then uh, which you can then maybe give as a present to your dad on Christmas or something. <laughs> I actually That's got a vinyl uh, of you for my birthday this year. I actually wanted to get you to sign it, but <laughs> sadly, 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 I did not bring it with me. I forgot it in my fucking house. <laughs> next, next BDME. <laughs> next BDME, exactly. <laughs> Well, I actually hope to see you in Barcelona as well, if you're there. Oh, yeah. You're coming? Well, I am in Barcelona. I live there now, so... Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, sick. Okay. Yeah, I can get you guests as well, if you want. <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> so, and you mentioned Sidney Charles at the very beginning, and as being one of your idols. How did that all come together, that you now collab with each other and now play with each other at many gigs? Uh, we're not going to play with each other, probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, the um, there was... You're saying this because of the Instagram story I posted, right? Where I'm going to play with him? Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, it's it's going to be some other time then. But uh, it's uh, tomorrow there's the Pit Festival where I was supposed to play with him. They had to make some uh, rescheduling, uh, some artists which couldn't come and, and all this stuff. So um, I had to take another spot. I was willing to, you know, so... Um, some other time I'm going to play with him then. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. And where can where can we see you next in total? Like, what are your next, like, um, gig plans? Or is there any tour be coming up? Or how do you even, like, just from my side, how do you even select with your gigs? Because so far I know you as being very selective about the gigs that you play and where you want to play. So how does that even go? I'm not too selective with the gigs, I think. Um, I did... Luckily, the the schedule for the rest of the year is already full. Since I'm not because I'm playing like four times a weekend or something, but I try to reduce it to maybe one gig a weekend or two if it comes uh, or if it goes uh, big. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna play next uh, this tonight actually <laughs> with Talo together back to back at the Revier Südost for his uh, other party. Um, tomorrow at the Piff Festival, and um, yeah, apart from that, um, after that, I have a free week weekend again. <laughs> <laughs> so time for music so again. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, my, it's a block for my girlfriend. So uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she wants to get her share as well. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Um, what would you say was the was the biggest um, gig you played or festival, the one that you liked the most, where you had the most fun and said like, wow, this is like amazing? Um, one of them was definitely at Taushaven. Um, I think I I was playing there, but the, the experience of uh, being there actually, I don't know if you guys ever heard of it, but uh, Taushaven is it's like a mini festival location almost. You know, there's like a tractor standing there or something some some trains there on the other side almost a little bit like a junkyard but a beautiful junkyard um and yeah just uh being there in the summer with uh, a lot of nice people and good music on a good sound system is is crazy because like actually when the sun is uh when there's a dawn of the sun do you say it sunset. no dawn dawn is the rise right sunset 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 i was searching for there's the sunset and the, the the light is just shining into the booth and uh, you're looking around and there's nice people with good music. That was, uh, I kind of have it marked in my head definitely. And the other one I wanted to say is, um, not because he's sitting here, but uh, the the one in Revier Südost uh, last time actually was very, very, very good. Uh, we played like an extended set, I don't know for how long, but... Uh, yeah, until the sun was coming up again. You know, <laughs> it always has to do with the sun, seems to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, these two were awesome. And, uh, well, as you mentioned, Talu before, uh, you play a lot with him as well. And who's your favorite back to back buddy? Would that be him? He's one of them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think he is. Okay, yeah. Talu. <laughs> <laughs> and who else do you enjoy playing with normally? Um, who else I want to go back to back with, or yeah, exactly. who I enjoy going back to oh, back with? Both, um, both actually. Uh, uh, 
I don't know, uh, a lot of people. <laughs> I always love to go back to back in general because um, you can kind of vibe from each other. You're, you kind of have the direct feedback from your body next to you, you know? Um, but um, yeah, who else? I can't tell you anyone right now, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so when, when you do like all these things with like Talu and all those guys, um, how does that all fit with you now, now in your normal daily job? So now you, you, you're pretty free and you, you pretty much concentrate just on that. Um, how does that really work out? Like um, you said you don't have a really schedule with that, but fitting all in your girlfriend and the tours and everything, now is it free time? And how did even Corona influence you with the whole decision of like leaving your job and now being full-time uh, music production or a music artist? Because I mean... We all know now with the corona situation that there can be a big risk of doing that. Like, how did you feel about that? Well, um, that was one of the reasons I quit my job, which I was happy with before, uh, to have more time during the day to do all the other stuff which you need to do, even if it's household stuff, you know. So, um, but yeah, having a girlfriend obviously also takes a little bit of time. Um, and um, yeah, I was only quitting my job, and I think it was um, it was at the end of the quarantine, whenever that exact moment was. But uh, I've made the decision during the quarantine because I could see that even without the gigs, there's there's actually an income which can support my current lifestyle. And since I'm a little German at heart, you know, I always need to, my little security behind <laughs> it, you know, and I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to worry about like ah, I need this gig. I want to play this gig, even though if I maybe don't want to. So um, yeah. So from all the streams and uh, releases, sales and stuff, um, now I can use my free time to chase the labels if they've made any sales. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's actually uh, doing all right. So I can not worry too much about taking every gig uh, and. Do it like this, yeah. Okay, nice. And even like with those gigs, you said you have a manager. Does he also take care of the bookings then, or is that just you doing it yourself? Do you just like get like um, inbox inbox messages, or do you actually like approach um, like festivals or um, clubs where you want to play as well? Uh, since he has a good like connection, he's been doing events for for several years with like big guys. He has kind of if he wants to put me somewhere. He might have the um, the power to do so, but uh, that's not the reason why he's like my manager or something. I, th I just think that the reason why he why I wanted him to help me and uh, pay him for it obviously is um, because uh, the label which he which he is doing is so great. Like everything from him taking the vinyls or the the vinyls get sent to his place, and he then sends it to all the record stores in the world, like to technique in Yo Tokyo or something, you know? He all does it by his, by hand, you know? And it doesn't stop there, you know? Like the artwork he does with the artist in Berlin, you know, the, the final product, you can see, like, takes care of it so much and so well that I thought, like, okay, if he's, like, kind of taking care of you a little bit, you can beat that product. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, I can understand that. <laughs> no, yeah, but that was the, the reason, yeah. Um, but uh, what was the other question again? There were two, like, right? No? <laughs> <laughs> well, go, um, go on. <laughs> tell us about also, like, um, you, you have a lot of, you're releasing a lot of vinyls at the moment as well, right? How many copies are there then normally? And you're saying they're getting sent out in the whole world, and this is what he does? He, like, takes care of that? Um, I mean, it varies. Obviously, the first release you're going to have with the labels. Maybe not, or the first releases I had on vinyl, they were all like, I don't know, 350 to 400, which is uh, the bare minimum, I think, which you can do. I think you can even do like 200 or something. But of course, you uh, there's two different things. Um, all the vinyl diggers and stuff, they um, are looking more into the vinyl section. And if there's a new face there, they need to be like... Um, <laughs> convinced a little bit, you know, it takes time for them to get the name on on their eyes as well uh, to get noticed. Noticed, yeah. So uh, the first pressings obviously are always a little bit uh, less, and now like slowly it's like progressing and getting a little bit more. So I think with the release on Stussy's label on uh, UTS up to Stuss, it was like a uh, thousand one hundred or a thousand two hundred pressings. 
and I don't know if it's been repressed, but um, yeah, this one was a lot for me. Um, and the one on Rutilance uh, got repressed two times, I think, or three times. So this is the one which sold the most, I think. So yeah, these are kind of the numbers, I think. Okay. Was there ever a moment for you when you were like really excited because somebody else played one of your tracks that you made and you were like, wow, he's actually playing my track or you got to see like him playing it or something like that? Or you were actually at a party and someone out of nowhere played your track where you would not have like <laughs> known that he was doing it? <laughs> okay, there were just two, two situations right now <laughs> uh, in my mind. Uh, the first one was definitely Stussy when they played like a track of me on like Loveland or something, you know, like one of the bigger festivals in uh, in Amsterdam. And coming from Germany, you know, like a house isn't really as yeah. big as it is over there. Sadly not. You know, so to see this many people like raving to the to your music, it's always incredible, you know. So um, definitely have to give it up to the to the Dutchies there, to the Dutch crew, including uh, Stussy who's been supporting me there. Uh, this was a definitely a which something which sparked a lot more coming after. And the other one was like a small bar in Cologne, which wasn't known for electronic music at all, but they played like an edit of me that I did <laughs> or something. And I was there with my friends who all don't listen to this music at all. Okay. I was like, yeah, this is a track I did. And they were like, nah, come on. <laughs> 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 like, yes. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> the small bar <laughs> was equally cool. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine, especially with the friends. <laughs> especially with the friends who don't listen to this shit at all, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you do actually have friends that are totally not into your music at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it, mostly the, the guys from back in the school, they, they tell me like they have me on Spotify or something to get the algorithm going, you know, <laughs> or something, <laughs> wow. but they don't really listen to so anything. So at least they're good <laughs> friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, you know, like they're supporting, uh, you know, but they wouldn't really listen to it in their free time, <laughs> which is all right. And this, this is why I love them, you know, so. <laughs> and uh, mentioning Amsterdam and uh, the Dutchies, how do you see, how do you feel like the, the, the whole scene in uh, the Netherlands uh, differs from the scene over here in Germany? Um, it's a lot more, uh, how do you say, I, I wouldn't say the music is more commercial, but the going to festivals and partying is a little bit more commercial, you know, since we uh, have here in Berlin uh, a lot of like no phone policies and stuff in clubs, you know, over there it's, m it's almost like a thing like to have enough videos after the gig of yourself playing and, you know, like it's always, there's more structure in this, you know, going to the gig with the videos, having someone who takes them for you and stuff, you know, everything's a little bit more how do you say, um, yeah, structured. And um, here it's a little bit more, you know, come come as you are or whatever, you know, uh, go with the flow. And uh, obviously the their um, principle works on getting to be known, you know, since Absolutely. they know that the videos of the festivals and the parties and stuff is, is what makes new people come, you know. Yep. Um, I'm a little bit there, you know, um, obviously it worked to a certain degree, um, uh, to a certain extent, but um, I don't want to be too structured like them, you know, so I take my little positive uh, piece uh, that they do from there and then take the other positive go with the flow, fuck everything thing uh, from here and combine it a little bit, you know, and find the balance through it. Okay, so. nice. Um, and what can we expect from you, like in the future? Like you said already, like you're totally booked out for most of the year, where you're going to play. Um, are there big releases coming up from you on on labels that you've been waiting for to play with, or like to to release with, or what's coming up next with you? And I think the next one coming up is the is an LP, uh, not an album because it's all like club tracks, and uh, then for me it's not an album. Uh, but it's a uh, it's an LP on Berg Audio on the label I've been telling you about earlier. It's the third and last one of the series. Um, yeah, I think the, the preset just gone up like uh, the moment we entered <laughs> uh, the building. So um, yeah, very, very excited about this one. It's gonna come with a remix by you and Ewan, if you say it right like this. And um, yeah, gonna be eight tracks, I think, uh, which have been, uh, yeah, I, thi I think the oldest one I did like two years ago or two and a half years ago. So, yeah, 
there again is like the point where you find maybe some stuff which you've done in the past which you feel good about again you know after reviewing it yourself so you do combine things like that that you maybe did a track yesterday but then you find a track you made like you said like two years ago and then you yep. just you put them on an EP together or an LP even like if they fit together if it fits yeah yeah definitely I'd, then I would just send him a batch you know with the oldest ones and the new ones or sometimes he, he would even have like a mark on an old track that he that I sent him and then he comes like ah do you still have that track available and stuff and um, I would say yes for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, <then laughs> uh, and you mentioned this was a series. What do you mean with like this being a series? And this being the last one of these series as well? Yes, um, I had like the first release I had with Berg Audio was called Endless Explorations. Um, so we kept on continuing continu continuing with that name and called the, the second one Endless Explorations Part 2. And now <laughs> this is going to be three. Endless Explorations Part 3. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> and would you say all the tracks are related with each other? So they have like a flow or even like tell a story through these like three series? It's definitely one one side of me, you know. So um, they've I've not done them consecutively after each other, you know. But um, every, every now and then I'm listening to like dub, dubby house tracks or dub techno. And then I feel the urge to do something in that direction again. And this is mostly, these are the kind of tracks then which go on this kind of label, on this EP or LP. Yeah. Okay, nice. Uh, um, so at, as we're almost at the end of the panel, I just wanted to give uh, the chance to the people in the audience to ask you some questions. Is there anybody who has a question to Joko? Okay, nobody has questions. <laughs> nice. Hey, uh, What's I'm up? Phil. Nice, nice to meet you. What, Flo? Um, no, Phil. 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 Um, really appreciate your music, so big up on Thanks, that. Man. Um, but I was wondering, was there uh, a milestone in your career where you kind of decided for yourself, okay, now I can do this full time, and now the, the switch kind of flipped? I, I mean, the full time thing would be quitting the job, I guess. But um, the the time which you're talking of is uh, definitely the moment I described earlier when uh, Chris Dussie and the Dutchies were supporting my music, you know, since they had like a big audience, you know, and uh, obviously when the videos look cool with your music, mm -hmm. this is the best promotion you can have for yourself, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say this was the kind of turning point or yeah. something, however you say it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool, thanks. So then, yes, I would say uh, we come to an end over here. It was really a pleasure being with you here and having you as a guest at the Berlin Dance Music event. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. <laughs> until next year. Yeah, until next year. <laughs> so thank you for everybody, and uh, yeah, until next year. Yep.